Okay, so my, the focus of my talk is going to be on um, surgical prophylaxis and, and antimicrobial stewardship. It's just that we've seen this specific aspect of, of prescribing for the surgical patient is, is a sometimes problematic, um, you know, in our practice that we've seen. So we're going to just look at uh, the definition of the different surgical site infections. We're going to classify surgical site infections, list of factors that are identified to be associated with associated with surgical site infections, then look at strategies to prevent this, um, and then we just kind of broadly discuss the principles of surgical prophylaxis. And then also then bring in the, the concepts of antimicrobial stewardship when we are prescribing um, surgical prophylaxis. And the, then just in short, the important role of, of surveillance in monitoring um, surgical site infections. Okay, so healthcare associated infections is an infection that's localized or, or a systemic infection. It's associated with medical intervention. And like we all know, it's not present or incubating at the time of admission. It may be endogenous or exogenous, um, and it includes, includes all healthcare facilities um, you know, other than hospitals. So all the different types of healthcare associated infections, definitely surgical site infections features there, and it's a, it's a, it's a, big, a big burden if you look at, at the burden of healthcare associated infections. So what is the problem if a, if a patient develops a, you know, a healthcare associated infections? We definitely have increased morbidity and mortality. There's a longer length of hospital stay, increased costs, uh, more resistant organisms that develop and the use of uh, restricted, restricted and very expensive antibiotics. Okay, so the ideal management is always prevention is better than cure. So surgical site infections occur at the incision site um, and it can be in, in the deeper underlying tissue spaces and the organs organs and the de definition is usually saying within 30 days of a surgical procedure or if, there's, um, if it involves a prosthetic material, usually within 19 days, 19 days, sorry. It is the most surveyed and frequent type of healthcare associated infections in lower and middle income countries and affects up to 30% of patients who have undergone the surgical procedure. Um, and it makes up to 20% of all, you know, the overall um, healthcare associated infections in low to middle income countries. Like we said, it really causes significant morbidity, mortality, um, increasing cost and hospital stay. So this was a study, a point prevalence study that was done at the Kimberley um, Hospital Complex, where they just uh, you know, went, went into each ward for one day and just uh, did the prevalence of the healthcare associated infections. And as you can see there, the surgical site infections made up almost 60% of all the healthcare associated infections. So very high prevalence um, compared to the others. So how do we classify surgical site infections? You can have a superficial incision um, and then uh, into your deep incisional, whether it's the primary incision or the second, secondary incision, um, where they went for relux. And then of course the organal space, uh, spaces that are involved in, in the deeper tissues. So surgical wounds are also classified according to um, whether they are clean. Um, and then the, the ones in the red blocks are usually the ones that we need surgical uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for. So if it's a clean, uninfected operative wound, there's no inflammation, your respiratory, alimentary, genital, or um, urinary tracts are not entered. Um, the wounds are, are primary closed and maybe even a drain, but usually those who don't need prophylaxis for, but the others definitely the, the rate of, of developing a surgical site infection are higher, so we need um, antibiotic prophylaxis for these. Okay, so they are, surgical site infections are usually caused by pathogens that's inoculated at the time of the surgery and usually caused mostly by the patient's own, own normal flora, so mostly the skin pathogens or then if, you, if you're going to do um, a gastrointestinal procedure, it can also be some of the enteric um, pathogens that you then need to cover. Um, but of course, we know exogenous sources are also possible um, later on. Okay, so just in terms of um, what do we usually, um, you know, culture from surgical site infections. 
So this is, of course, an American study from the National Healthcare Safety Network looking at surgical site infections and what are the most common pathogens that, that they isolated. So definitely staph aureus is number one there, followed by coagulase negative staph. Then there's also E. coli, e. coli Enterococcus faecalis, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We definitely know in our setting that Klebsiella is also, also quite high on the list. Okay, so patient-related factors that we always just need to keep in mind is, is extremes of age, diabetes, mellitus, um, post-op hypoglycemia, malnutrition, smoking, obesity, if the patient is on any immunosuppressive medications or any immunosuppressive conditions. Um, is there, if there's any decreased top tissue oxygenation, so if there's maybe already a necrosis or insufficient um, you know, arterial supply, if there's any hypothermia, anticoagulation that was administered, or any blood transfusion. So all of these are associated with, with then, um, surgical site infections. And some of them are, um, you know, you, you, can, you can have an intervention or somebody can stop smoking or, or whatever. Some of these you can really um, prevent. So what are some of the strategies to prevent surgical site infections? So the red one, so this is from the, from the WHO Global Guidelines for the Prevention of Surgical Site Infections. And there's definitely strong favor for the ones in red. So yes, definitely use of periop um, oxygen, maintain oxygenation, but surgical hand preparation is extremely important. And then hair removal. It shouldn't be removed um, at all, or if there's excess hair, you can use clippers to trim, but definitely no shaving at all. Um, and then the, the, the antibody prophylaxis, if indicated, should be given 60 minutes before the incision. Um, decolonization with mepirocin for staph aureus is mostly for our cardiothoracic um, surgery patients, but that is if, if you've got the facility for you know, seeing a patient pre-op, doing the screen, getting the screen results, um, the colonization results back in time before you do the op, and then you can do the, the decolonization with mepirocin. Okay, then the next one is um, definitely, definitely surgical site preparation is very important with uh, alcohol um, chlorhexidine um, mixture. Okay. okay, then just going into detail, you know, sort of pre op, peri op, and then post op, um, patients can definitely have a bath or shower just to decrease that, that load of normal flora, and they can just use a, a plain soap. Um, then we mentioned about the, the, the pre-op screening, if, you, if you're able to do that um, and your patient are colonized with stuff always, you can, you can do the intranasal bupyrosin ointment before. Um, then we've mentioned the surgical antibody prophylaxis, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later on. Um, and then the panel does suggest that patients is undergoing elective colorectal surgery, that they have pre-op oral antibiotics combined with the mechanical bowel preparation. Um, can be done. Um, and then we talked about the hair, never, never to be shaved, um, only to be trimmed with clippers. Um, the surgical site skin prep um, and then the hand prep are two very important um, concepts. So perioperative is really to, to maintain good oxygenation um, if, if your patient is underweight or there's malnutrition just to provide um, uh, extra nutritional support. Maintain normothermia, maintain normovolemia. Um, for, for both your diabetic and non-diabetic patients to control the blood glucose and have a, you know, a controlled blood glucose, a sterile gloves, sterile drapes, st sterile surgical gowns. Um, they also mentioned the triclosan coated sutures, which, which we don't have available. Um, and then very important, you should not prolong your surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, after the completion of the operation. There are some exceptions that may exist, and this is, you know, from patient to patient, if there's maybe excess bleeding, or, you know, and you basically just have to transfuse the patient and all the antibiotics are, are basically washed out. Um, and then, cardio, for example, cardiothoracic patients where you have to, um, you know, in certain circumstances, have to have an open chest. Um, so in this, those circumstances, it can be discussed that the, the prophylaxis be, um, be prolonged beyond what, what is in the guidelines. 
Okay, so why do we give antibiotic prophylaxis? It's basically just to augment the, the host's natural defense and help kill the bacteria that are present on the, on the wound or, or, or on the skin during the incision and then during the procedure. Um, of course, the antibiotic must be in the tissue before the, the bacteria are introduced. So that's why we say um, you know, 60 minutes before the, the first incision is made. Um, really no data to support more than one dose and only a second dose if, if, if the operation is going on for more than three hours or like we mentioned in the, in the pre previous two scenarios. Um, any, any further doses that really constitutes treatment. So then you suspect there is already an infection. This requires then the appropriate micro, uh, microbiological investigation and appropriate specimen submission. Um, and that's basically then you know, treatment and it's no longer prophylaxis. Um, so which, which antibiotic do we give for which um, procedure? Um, we've looked at that table of, of what are the most common, um, common bacteria that we isolate from surgical site infections. Um, and really, there is no difference between the efficacy between the first, second and third generation skifosporin. So we always like to stick with the narrow spectrum. So in most cases, skifosolin um, should cover, should cover the most um, organisms, and, but it also depends on, like I said, on the procedure. So we really need a coordinated strategy for quality improvement and the appropriate use of antimicrobial agents to optimize the clin clinical outcomes of patients and really minimize the collateral damage that, that antimicrobials have in terms of the resistance and of course the C. diff infections that we see. So that's where the antimicrobial stewardship then, then comes in in terms of the, the surgical prophylaxis. Just a table of, again of the most common things that we need to cover. Um, we've mentioned that. And then just to give you some examples of, of guidelines of surgical prophylaxis that we have. So this one is from the South African Antibiotic Stewardship Program. And it really literally lists, lists all the types of surgery and the dose that must be given and just one dose, um, you know, 60 minutes before the incision. So you can see the types of surgery, cardiothoracic, upper GI, neurosurgery, orthopedic, kefazolin is, is sufficient. Um, when you're starting to suspect there might be some anaerobes involved, like your, um, you know, if there's a lower limb uh, that needs to be amputated or colorectal surgery, biliary surgery, pelvic surgery, and ENT surgery, you can add on metronidazole just to cover, cover your, your, your anaerobes. Your ophthal ophthalmic surgery, um, usually you just need the chloramphenicol um, local drops. If there's an ERCP with obstruction, it gets a bit more complicated, then you need a bit more gram-negative cover. So there the suggestion is superfloxacin um, or kefiroxime just to cover, or piptaz, um, just to cover a bit more of your, of your gram-negatives. Um, then any uh, you know, prosthetic material, kefazolin or kefiroxime is fine. Um, penetrating abdominal trauma, again, you just need to cover for your anaerobes. And if it's a very prolonged procedure, we know often these, these tra trauma can be multiple and, and the procedures can be prolonged. So in, in that case, you can give a second dose if, if it's longer than three hours. Okay, the next example I have is from the Gauteng Province um, Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee, specific antibiotic prophylaxis in surgery. It is very similar. Um, sometimes you can um, you can substitute, or they they suggest that you can substitute, you know, the kefazolin plus metronidazole with augmentin, because that will then cover both gram positive, gram negatives, and your anaerobes. So that's a, definitely an option. Um, and the rest, yeah, it's like you can see, it's mostly kefazolin, um, and then you can either go with metronidazole or augmentin in, in case you need to um, to cover the the anaerobes. So there they've also got something like a prostatectomy. Um, they again more like gram negatives you need to cover so that you can rather go with ciprofloxacin or gentamicin. Okay so um, you know in terms of surgical site infections if we don't know what's going on we can't really act on the problem so you can't fix if we don't know what's going on. So the, really the first step is is surveillance. So surveillance is um, it's information for action. So the di different types of surveillance we can use is direct versus indirect and active versus passive. 
So I specifically want to want to want to just mention the direct and indirect. Direct is, is usually the gold standard that's used for studies, uh, but you need a daily observation and and you need to note. Um, you know, if there is any evidence of surgical site infection. Um, this is really implemented because, because of our resources, not really practi practical and, and, and very expensive. So usually what is, what is used in daily life is, is an indirect approach where it's a combination of looking at the micro reports, um, patient medical records, um, sometimes they can do surgeon or patient surveys, they look at you know screenings through readmission, uh, readmissions, um, relooks, and other info like coded diagnosis, theater reports, and so on. Um, this is less time consuming and and can be formed by your infection prevention and control staff. All right, but um, it of course will miss those patients that that went home had the superficial incisional infections. Um, was not really necessary for readmission. So those ones you will, you will miss, of course. Okay, then some just tools to assist you. Um, on the EM guidance app, you can find all these uh, prophylactic guidelines, the SASP ones that I had on. Um, there's also the most recent um, CMJH antimicrobial therapy guideline, um, the Gauteng province one, and then there's also a national department of health uh, surgical antibiotic prophylaxis um, up on there. Okay, my references. 